Amen, amen, amen. You're part of that. You're part of that thing. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see the faithful few here. This is awesome. So, so awesome. We have to try to do our best to practice our six-foot craziness. Um, I just want to let you know that um, you're not in any fear of being bum-rushed by the police, and uh, I'm not in any danger of being arrested. Our uh, wonderful city council has said, yeah, that's the rules, but we're not enforcing them here. So, yeah, happy about that. <clears throat> um, probably don't want to put that online. <laughs> it's probably the edit button that's needed there um, for real. Um, so, but we're here, and it's been a crazy couple of weeks, and uh, I don't know if it's going to get crazier, and I don't know what side of the fence you land on, but I know for me, um, I'm into the obey God's word thing. That's my thing. And uh, I know I'm not alone in the room with that. And uh, so I'm encouraged that sometimes you stand alone as a pastor, but uh, today I don't feel that. I feel like I'm, I've got some warriors with me. That's good, right? Yeah, it's good. So we're going to do what God has called us to do, and we're going to, um, we're going to not forsake the assembly. We're gathering here, and we're going to, um, as I always say, not just have a lesson about God, but hopefully have an experience with him. And uh, I know I had some of that in my little corner back there just a few moments ago, and uh, I know I'm not alone. Uh, but why don't we turn our attention now to God's word, and let's hear him speak to us. And we'll hear his words uh, in, in Acts chapter 12. Why don't you go there, Acts chapter 12. We'll continue our series uh, to the ends of the earth. And when, when, when Jesus starts out there uh, setting the, the mission out for the church, there you see it in Acts 1, uh, 8, it says that uh, you're going to receive power from upon high. My Holy Ghost is going to come. And, and, and when that happens, you're going to receive power and what's the power to do? The power is to be his witnesses, right? So they're gonna, we're going to be able to, when they see you, they're going to hear of him, right? So, so you're going you're gonna to be his witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So here, bring up, bring up that map real quick, okay? So if you see here, let's just see if, if what is uh, predicted by Jesus, who is now quote-unquote, dead, right? Dead guys usually don't have much pull, do they? But the dead guy says that you're going to be my witnesses when the Holy Ghost falls, and you're going to be my witnesses to Jerusalem. See that down there? See, my back's been out for eight days now, so I'm not going to bend over. You see Jerusalem down there? You guys see it? See it, see it, see it right? So, so you're going to be my, my, my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's where it all started. That was Pentecost. Holy Ghost drops, and you're going to be a witness Jerusalem, Judea, which is where the area, right, where Jerusalem is. You see it down there at the bottom, right? Samaria, which is all this area up here, and to the ends of the earth. So what's happened is Stephen preaches about Jesus, gets stoned to death, and so persecution breaks out. And what happens, last week we saw this, that all of a sudden they leave Jerusalem, and what do they do? They go to Phoenicia, right here, right? They're spreading. Uh, Antioch of Syria, so now they're in Samaria, uh, and they went out to Cyprus over here, right? You, so you see what's happening? Exactly what Jesus said would happen is exactly what's happening, and he's got, he's got some pull, so his people are doing some things, and the people that are opposing him are doing some things, and they don't understand that they're playing right into his plan, right? So exactly what he said was happen, would happen is exactly what's happening, and that's where we find ourselves. And so this whole study of the book of Acts is to see how that happens. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And that's exactly what happens. And so that's why we're studying this book. Two, two reasons why we're studying the book. Um, it's twofold. One, it's historical, Okay. And, and so I would say this, that better informed Christians are better worshipers, right? They're better worshipers because, you know, the, the word of God says that he wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Can you kill that map so I can see? Thanks. So um, we're supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so that's one of the reasons why we studied the book of Acts is to get that historical perspective. It's just a history book in a sense. It's telling us exactly what happened. How do you worship God if you don't know who he is, right? 
So that's why we're studying the book of Acts. We want to find out what happens so we can be better informed as to who we're worshiping. And then, secondly, not historical, but um, prescriptive. That means not only truth shared, but examples shown. We want to see uh, a model for us before our eyes so that we can know You know, hey, this is who Jesus is, this is what he taught, this is what he said, this is what we should do, and then we want to learn what response looks like, right? We want to know what response looked like so that we know what response should look like in our lives, right? And and why should it look like this? Why should it look like what we see in the book of Acts? Why, Why should it look like that? Well, because in a real practical sense, it was the response that we see there that actually fulfilled this commission of Jesus to go make disciples of all people, be witnesses to the ends of the earth, because, listen, we're in Leesburg. 2,000 years later, 6,500 miles away, so guess what? It worked. That's why this is the example we should follow, right? That's why. That Very plainly, it's because this way that we see works. Right? We don't have to come up with another plan. You don't have to come up with plan B. Don't reinvent the wheel. This response that we see in the scriptures works in reaching the ends of the earth with the gospel. But the question that I have for you today is this. Why is it that they were so bold? Why is it that they would be willing to risk? Why would they be willing to suffer persecution to reach the ends of the earth? What motivates the Christian to advance Christ's kingdom? And not only motivates them, but makes Christ's kingdom the single most important element of their life. And therefore, what would make it the single most important element of your life and mine? What makes advancing the kingdom trump family and money and career and country and comfort and yourself? What motivates these Jesus freaks in the book of Acts to do what they did and tolerate what they tolerated to get this done. And I think that what I'm about to talk to you about today, although this should be encouraging, but it should be no new news. But I think this thing right here might be the reason why we see so much complacency and lethargy in the body of Christ. I think this is why we as church leaders need to beg people to get off their hiney and do anything for Christ and his church. I think this is what it is right now. We need this motivation. This is going to put some nitrous oxide in your tank, okay? Acts chapter 12 Starting in verse 20, and I'm expositional preacher, right? So we're supposed to pick up where we left off, but we don't need to do that in this case because uh, verses 1 through 19, Pastor Jay preached that text just a couple months ago clearly and accurately, and I wouldn't change it, and it's on our YouTube channel. You want to see it? There it is. Go to it, okay? But for us, Acts chapter 20, verses 20 through 24. So now Herod, King Herod, was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So they sent a delegation to make peace with him because their cities were dependent upon Herod's country for food. The delegates won the support of Blastus. Side note, if Meredith and I were younger, if we had another son, his name would be Blastus. I just think that's the coolest name ever, right? What's your son's name? Uh, Blastus, <laughs> right? And like, whoa, that is the toughest, coolest name of all time. It's my son, Blastus. The delegates won the support of Blastus, Herod's personal assistant. An appointment with Herod was granted. When the day arrived, Herod put on his royal robes, sat on his throne, and made a speech to them. Do you see it? Do you see it in your eye? Do you see it happening? Royal robes on the throne, making a speech, probably on a platform, right? High, lifted up, king. The people gave him a great ovation. Would that be bad to do? No. Not at all. But 
They said it's a voice of a God, not a man. Instantly, an angel of the Lord struck Herod with a sickness because he accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God. So he was consumed with worms and died. You know what the big word is there? Instantly. Bam! Just like that. Just like that. Okay, so let's, let's just start with junior varsity, sophomoric, entry-level observation of what's here. For those that think that somehow God changed from Old Testament justice God and smiting God and to the New Testament grace God, love and mercy only God. Uh, exhibit A for Malachi 3.6, I am the Lord, I do not change. Okay? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be deceived by hyper-grace teaching that says he is love and mercy, and that's it. Bam! Done, right? Dead on the spot. Why? Why did he do this? Well, let's start here. Exodus 20, verse 3. You don't have to go there. It's a familiar text. Everybody knows it's the first commandment, right? It's the first commandment. What does it say? You must not have any other God but me. Right? Now he goes on to say, God says in his Ten Commandments, I'm a, why, why, why? Why should you have no other God? I'm jealous. I'm a jealous God, which means, he goes on to say, that I will not tolerate your affection for any other God. Do not bow down or worship another. Right? That's why. And so when Herod willingly received worship when it didn't belong to him, dead. Will he do that to you? Loved ones, I don't know. I don't know. You want to chance it? This is on, listen, listen, this is on the right side of the book. This is on the, this is on the Jesus side, right? This is on the grace side. This is on the love side. This is on the mercy side. He received worship. God killed him, Okay? So, um, base level, it's a powerful story. It's amazing. God is unchanging, right? For sure to all those things. That's not the only time that's ever really happened in Scripture. I'm going to ruin chapter 14 for us, so I can't get to it and preach it probably too well because I'm going to tell you about it right now, but something like this happened in Acts 14 too. So in Acts 14, um, Paul and Barnabas are going along, and they're doing what, what apostles do, right? Stand up and walk. You know, have sight. Be healed. That's just what they do, right? And so there's this guy who's crippled, and they bring Christ's healing, you know. I don't know exactly what they said, but stand up and walk. Seems normal in the Bible, doesn't it? Stand up and walk. And so what happens there in that story is that the people think that they're gods. So they try to worship Paul and Barnabas, they begin to offer sacrifices to them. But instead of what Herod did, which was sit, sit on his throne and go, oh yeah, come on, right? And he died. What did Paul and Barnabas do? They, you can see in the Bible they yelled, stop! We're just people. Turn to God. That's where praise and glory and worship go, not to us, right? So, so listen, this story about Herod this reminds me of the motivation to be a Jesus freak and make the kingdom advancing the most important thing of my life. It's this. It's that Jesus is Lord. That's why. Right? Is that new in the church? How many new things should be hearing in the church? Not a whole lot. This is what we should be talking about in church. Jesus Christ is Lord. Get our minds off of ourself and our circumstance and get it back on Jesus. Jesus Christ is Lord. And listen, this, is, this sounds really basic. Like, wow, well, I know that, but a lot of people struggle with that. Tons of people struggle with this reality. They think, you know, he's a good man. He's a moral teacher. He's a prophet. He's a rabbi. And yes, to all those things, he is that for sure. All those things. But 
advancing his kingdom with relentless boldness and making it the all-consuming effort of your life only happens like it did to those folks in the book of Acts when the lordship of Jesus becomes your reality. That's the only way you're going to give yourself over to something completely and wholeheartedly reckless abandon as if you know that Jesus is not just a prophet, but that he is Lord. That's the only way. And so who is this Jesus Christ that I proclaim to you today? Well, let's let the word of God answer this question. And, and the reason why I jumped off here, because this story right here about Herod, it reminded me again who Herod isn't and afresh who Jesus is. Okay, so here we, we talked about Exodus 20, right, the first commandment. How about if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4? You don't have to go there, but listen, if you go to temple like I did when I was a kid, you go and they always do repetitive stuff over and over and over and over and over and over again. Some of it's good, some of it's probably not. I didn't understand half of it. But there's one thing that they did all the time. There's this prayer that they said all the time, all the time, all the time. It's called the Shema. And the Shema starts out with this right here in Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. The Lord is one. That's just Exodus 20, verse 3 again, right? There's only one God. Don't make another one. Don't bow or worship before another. Only me, one. There is only one real God, and it ain't Herod. And it ain't Paul, and it ain't Barnabas, and it ain't me. Look at your neighbor and say, it ain't you either. Now say this, more importantly, it ain't me. It ain't me. See, you know the thing that's weird about, about God is that in this world, in this country, in this world, really, if you're a Christian or if you're some hybrid Christian made-up thing that you call Christ, or if you're Jewish, most of the religions that would even consider Jesus in any way. God the Father, this thing, is assumed. Nobody ever, if you're a religious guy or gal, if you're a, if you believe, right, you believe in God, you know there's this thing up there, right? You don't really know what it is, but he's there, right? He's kind of assumed. And nobody has a problem with that God up, the big man upstairs, Right? The, the, the existence of this, this being, this heavenly being that kind of oversees and runs stuff, and we all know that. And nobody has a problem with what we would call God the Father. But listen, if you have no problem with God the Father, then worshiping God the Father means obeying what God the Father says. Would you agree? Right. Okay. So here's what God the Father says about Jesus Christ. Turn your, in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 6. And when he brought his firstborn son, so he's talking about the son, he's talking about Jesus, into the world. This is what God said. Now in quotes, let all of God's angels Worship him. Regarding the angels, he says, he sends his angels like the winds and his servants like flames of fire. But to the Son, Jesus, he says this, your throne, O God. What? God, that we all assume is real, is now calling Jesus God. Right? <laughs> God. Your throne, O oh God, endures forever and ever. You rule with a scepter of justice. You love justice and hate evil. Therefore, O oh God, your God, what's going on here? Right? Therefore, O oh God, your God has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you, more than on anyone else. He also says to the Son, in the beginning, Lord, yeah, God the Father, this, this heavenly being that no one could cast their eyes upon unless they get consumed by fire, says to Jesus, you are Lord and you are God. And all my angels will bow to worship you 
That's crazy. In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth. Creator, creator, God the Father is attributing creation to his son, Jesus Christ. In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth. You made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you remain forever. Jesus is eternal. This is not me or you saying this. This is God the Father saying, Jesus, you are Lord, God, creator, and eternal. That's why we worship him. Amen. You will find them, you will fold them up like a cloak. No, sorry, they will perish, but you remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. You will fold them up like a cloak and discard them like old clothing. But you are always the same and you live forever lord god creator and eternal that's who jesus christ is the apostle paul knew this reality as well and when he penned his gospel the gospel of john the fourth book of the new testament look how he starts it out in the beginning was the word. Now, pause for a second, because if you don't know, you go down to verse 14, it tells you what the word is. Because it's like the word, the word, what's this word thing? So verse 14 says that the word became flesh, put on skin, right, and dwelt among us. Who's the only person who's ever supposedly done that? Jesus Christ, okay? So now we understand what the word is. So let's substitute the word word with Jesus, okay? In the beginning, Jesus already existed. Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, which is Jesus. And nothing was created except through Jesus. Jesus gave life to everything that was created. And Jesus' life brought light to everyone. Jesus shines in the darkness. And the darkness can never extinguish him. So, you see there also, not just God the Father, but the Apostle John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, telling us who Jesus is. He is with God the Father, and he is also God. He was in the beginning already. Don't ask me to explain that. <laughs> that would be a failure on my behalf. And he created everything. So when the Bible talks about God speaking, and there was, it was the second person of the Trinity opening his mouth and speaking the universe into existence. That's why we worship him. That's why we invade the world with the gospel. That's the motivation for being a Jesus freak and making the kingdom advancing the most important part of your life. I noticed something else about this, what John wrote. Look at the first three words of what John wrote there in the Gospels. What's the first three words? In the beginning. In the beginning. In the beginning. Does that, does that sound familiar? Genesis, right? The very first thing in all of Scripture, it says this. In the beginning... God created. In the beginning, God. What does John say? In the beginning, Jesus. I just find that to be awfully strange. That it's the exact same thing. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus created. John is just repeating to us what we've already known forever. That God created the universe, and God has a name. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. In the beginning was Jesus. Jesus is the God who was and is and is to come. Jesus existed before anything was and he merely spoke and the universe was created. Jesus Christ from everlasting to everlasting, he is the God that does not change. And listen, not just do angels bow and worship him according to the book of Hebrews, but John also tells us that not only at the beginning was God, but at the end of the book, 
in Revelation chapter 7, when John opens his eyes and sees this, this, this vision of the eternal kingdom to come and come soon, it says that there will be crowds too vast to count from every tribe, tongue, and nation standing before the throne and before the Lamb with palms and hands shouting, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. But now listen, please do me a favor and open up your Bible to Revelation chapter 7. You've got to see this. I just noticed this the other day. How many people have read Revelation more than five times? Okay, right? So I have two, right? But all of a sudden you see something, you're like, what? Right? So this is what happened. Look in Revelation chapter 7, verse 17. What's that say there? Right. I don't know what Bible you have. On the throne, center of the throne, middle of the throne. Who's on the throne? The Lamb is on the throne. That's why we worship Him. Right? He's not some secret thing that only some people get. Right? Whether you believe in Him or not, Jesus Christ is on the throne of heaven and earth. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He's the sustainer of heaven and earth, right? He is eternal. He's creator. That's who Jesus is. That's why. And if you don't grab a hold of who he is, you'll never give your life over to his mission. Never. Never. Jesus is at the center of the throne. So God says something. The Father says something about Jesus. The Apostle John says something about Jesus. Behave yourself. Hey! Behave. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Old school church up in here, huh? Amen. <laughs> yeah, I knew Jeff you'd say something. <laughs> so, not only does uh, God the Father know who Jesus is, and the Apostle Paul, I mean, the Apostle John knows who Jesus is, but how about the Apostle Paul? See, we can't just grab, like, you don't proof text the Bible, right? You don't grab some verse and go, whoa, this is it. Man, this should be all through the Bible if you're going to form a doctrine on that thing, right? So God the Father says something. The Apostle John says something. How about the Apostle Paul? He understood who Jesus was. Look at Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. Tell me when you're there. Okay, listen. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who will rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. You know, I've been doing this a long time. And you know, what I, you know how I feel about myself. But there's a reason why I keep doing what I'm doing all these years. I don't, let me think. I think you've known me longer than anyone in this room. And I'm still doing this. Why? Is it because we grew the biggest church? Is it because I made a bunch of money? Or is it because that's the most worn out page in my Bible? That's why. That's the reason why I keep doing this because everything was created by him and for him. So I don't have a choice. The choice is not, there's no other choice available. I don't know of another choice than to show up again and again and again and again and make this the most important thing of my life. And it's because I've worn this page out. And I let those truth words permeate my brain endlessly and it motivates me to keep on going. 
I would suggest to you that you highlight that page and go back to it again and again and again, and it will put fuel in your tank to once again attack darkness and invade it with the light of Christ. Never stop. Never, ever stop. So what does Paul say here? Just like God the Father said, just like the Apostle John said, Christ the Creator. Christ the Creator, right? Above all things. He's, 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 he's not just the, the greatest angel, right? Like some cults would say. He, in, he created the angels, right? He created the angels. He, there's nothing that's been created that Jesus Christ did not create. But here's the thing that sums it up. This is the, this is the, this is the summary of, of what's most important right here. It's all summarized in verse 19. For God in all his fullness was pleased to dwell in Christ. Everything that God ever was and is and will be was walking along the dusty roads of Jerusalem in Jesus Christ. There was no failure. There was no flaw. There was no deficit. There was no shortage of deity in Jesus Christ while he walked on this earth. This is so important that God inspired Paul to rewrite this truth, but in greater detail in chapter 2, verse 9 of Colossians, where it says, in Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You have to, this blew my brains apart this week. You have to stop there. Do you know what the Godhead is? Anyone? Right. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So listen to what Paul says. And that man who was walking around in his sandals and robe through Jerusalem and and, and around the, the Sea of Galilee and all that, in that person, in the baby, in the stable, in the baby, dwelled God the Father in his fullness, the Son in his fullness, and, I've never heard about this before, and the Holy Spirit in his fullness in the body of Jesus Christ. Every minute of every day of his life, the fullness of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was dwelling in that man. Now, did the Holy Spirit descend upon him when he got baptized? But the the Holy Spirit was already in his fullness dwelling in Christ. He didn't get filled with the Holy Spirit at the Jordan. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. I think that dove was more for you and me than it was for him. Right? He was the essence of all that God has ever been and ever will be was walking in that man. That's who Jesus Christ is and that's why we worship him. Paul understood who Jesus was, and that's why he was completely sold out, completely all in, recklessly submitting to advancing Christ's kingdom. And he is not to be praised, he is to be copied. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Don't envy me, don't don't praise me, don't tell me how awesome I am, do as I do. And he was all in. John and Paul knew who Jesus was. Do you? Do you know who Jesus Christ is? And others, listen, these guys, Paul and and John, were not exclusive. There were other people that knew about it as well. They figured it out in a hurry. Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, right? When Jesus was born, the, the magi came, the wise men came, right? And what did they do when they entered that room where the baby was? They bowed and they worshipped him. Let me ask you a question. Did the baby Jesus get ate up by worms and die on the spot? Did the the magi somehow get smited for for false worship? Why? Because Jesus is Lord. That's why. Right? That's why. How about in Matthew 28, verse 9, as Jesus was getting ready to ascend to heaven? 
It says some of his lady disciples that were following him, what'd they do? They fell at his feet and worshiped. Did God the Father snap his fingers and make Jesus disappear into a cloud of dust because he was receiving worship that he didn't deserve? No, he ascended to heaven, let him sit down on the throne right with him. That's what he did. What about Luke 24, 52? He said all, the, all of Christ's disciples that were there, they worshiped him. Any of these accounts? Again, did God the Father somehow smite Jesus or smite the people, eat them up with worms or kill them in some way because of false, faulty, misguided worship? No. Not at all. Because in Christ dwelled the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's why. Because when you bow to Jesus, you're bowing to God. That's why. That's who he is. And all these folks got it. And that's all that matters, though, now is to you. And not with your mind, with your heart, with the very soul that's in you. Will your life reflect the fact that you believe with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength that Jesus Christ is Lord? And I would just encourage whoever amen there, and whoever would, don't amen if you will not bow. Do not. Do not. Because then you're amening to a false God. The real God demands this response. The real God doesn't like lukewarm, on the fence, beating around the bush, I'm a Christian person. No, you're not if you're not bowing the knee, worshiping him, and working your tail off to the end of building his kingdom and advancing that church to the ends of the earth. And that's it. That's it. Here's the most important thing, though. We see what the, the author of Hebrews says about God the Father. Well, maybe he misquoted, right? How about the Apostle John? He's a guy. Maybe he, maybe he messed up. People mess up, right? What about the Apostle Paul? He's a guy. Could have messed up. So here's the, here's the real litmus test. What does Jesus say about himself? That's all that really matters, right? That's all that really matters. And see, here's the thing. A lot of people, this is, this is the line. This is a war zone right here. Right here, we're about to cross this line, right? This is the war zone because a lot of people will say that Jesus was, or is, the way to God, but he's not God himself. That he was a prophet of God, and he would teach you how to get to God, but he never claimed himself. Like, those guys elevated him higher than he really belonged. Did you ever hear this one? The disciples, the apostles, the, 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 the writers, the... the, the uh, the Council of Nicaea that established the, the, the canon of Scripture, they, they elevated Jesus beyond really what he even said he was. He, he never claimed to be God, really. How about John chapter 10, verse 30? Put your eyes on it. John 10, 30. And while you're looking there, remember the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. That's one God and one God only, right? That's true. Nothing that Jesus could ever say would negate that. Do you agree? Even if he said it, then he'd be wrong. The Ten Commandments, first thing, right now, right? One God, Deuteronomy, one God. So what does Jesus say? 1030. The Father and I are one. Right? So he's saying, yeah, there's one God, and I'm him. Like, he's, he's either insane. Like, if he had said that, if God is God and he doesn't change, and he kills Herod for not even saying anything, just sitting up there going, yeah, buddy, this is great. Kills him dead. Jesus says, I'm God. No thunder, no lightning, no worms, no death, right? That's bold. So if he says it and he doesn't get killed, you better bow. You better bow, right? That's your only option. Now, but you, right? That sounds just like the Shema. The Lord is one. And here's the amazing thing. He never said he was a Christian. I mean, he never said he was God. He never said he was God. If you look at chapter 10, verse 33, even his accusers, what are they accusing him of? It says it right there. You're claiming to be God. 
right? So they even said it. So you can't just, I mean, it's clear as the day right there, right? It says right there, the people are standing right there, and he's claiming to be God. They said, you're claiming to be God. He never, I never said I was God. Yeah, duh. He's claiming to be God. How about John 14, verse 9? As we get there, right? He's, he's, he's getting ready to ascend. He's getting ready to leave, right? He's going to go to the cross. He's going to die for everybody's sin. He says, hey, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. When everything is right, I'll come back and I'll get you. And you'll know where I am and how to get there. How do we get there? He's like, how? they're like, how? What, what way? He's like, I am the way, the truth and the life. And no one gets to the Father except through me. And they're like, well, that's awesome. That's awesome, awesome. But if you could just let us see the Father, then we'd be satisfied. You know, like, we, you know, we love you, bro. And you're kind of awesome and nice and kind and you're sort of a big deal, but if we could kind of see the Father, and I'm thinking to myself, like, what were they thinking? You guys ever seen the movie The Smurfs? The Smurf movie? Where they, they come down from their place, and they come to Earth, and they're trying to get home, and the only way they can get home is if they open up, like, this portal into another world, and they got to try to jump through it and get back to where they live in their mushrooms. I was wondering, is that what the disciples were, were wanting? Like, Jesus, could you, like, just open up a portal and so we could look up into heaven and go, hey, uh, oh, hey, come here, guys. Come here, look. There's the Father right there. Like, what are they thinking? I don't even know how he would, right? What were, what were they asking him? But if you could just show us the Father, then we'd be satisfied. Then we could follow you if we see the Father. And Jesus, who has absolutely no identity crisis whatsoever, looks at Philip and says, Really? Have I been with you this long and still you don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Like, that's insane. When you see me, you see the eternal sovereign who you've never seen. It's me. I'm right here. Not me. Just. Yeah, I don't want no worms. That's who Jesus is. That's who Jesus is. So in some mysterious, mind-blowing way that I can't comprehend, not even close to be able to teach you, Jesus is the Father who is God. And this is not some new revelation in the New Testament or something that your preacher's coming up with today. 800 years before Jesus shows up in the manger, the, the Hebrew prophet Isaiah says that there will be a son born to us. It's in Isaiah 9. There'll be a son born to us, and he will be called Mighty God and Everlasting Father. <laughs> the son will be called the Father. Right? So this is nothing new. He is the Father Eternal, shown to us in the human being of Jesus Christ. That's who he is. Same as in John 1, right? Jesus was with God, and Jesus is God. He is the Son, but he's also the everlasting Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You've seen God, me. So let me clearly state why the early church boldly advanced the kingdom of Christ thought not of their own comfort, risked life and limb. Why exactly was growing his church the most important thing? Because Jesus Christ is Lord, God, and King. That's why, and that alone. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. And because Jesus has no identity issues, he is more than justified in saying, because I'm Lord, God, and King, that all authority in heaven and earth is mine, now go make disciples. And the only answer you have available to you is, yes, sir, and you go. That's it. That's it. There's no other option. Do you know another option? I don't know. There's plenty of options. They're in hell. But if you want to be in heaven, there's one option. That is bow to him in obedience and do as he says because he's Lord, God, and King. And that's it. That's it. Can you tell that I'm sick and tired of complacency? 
I'm going to preach like this till I stroke and die. But I'm going to do it. And one of these days, everyone's going to get it. I know in the land of the living, it's going to happen. <sighs> the deity of Jesus Christ is the core reality and motivation behind advancing his kingdom. Since Jesus is Lord, God, and King, then obedience is the why. That's it. Like we could come at it from over here and I could come over here or bird's eye view and I could wear some funny clothing and we can have some funny skit and, and illustrate in a bunch of different ways to try to get your attention. Oh, I think that's funny. I'll do it. Obey. Obey. If he's Lord, God, and King, obey. <laughs> obey. Now, I'm not totally stupid. I mean, I'm kind of stupid, but I'm not totally stupid. And so I understand that obedience isn't always easy or pleasant. Right? I get it. But uh, do you ever see online now they have these, uh, like, hacks and helps? And, like, you've got an issue, and, and there's, there's, there's got to be a way to fix that, right? So people come up with ways to, to fix things, right? So there's a, there's a life hack, right? There's a life hack. And it's right in the middle of our name. What makes this even possible? Love. Love. Love softens the edges of the pain of obedience. Love helps you want to submit and obey to Jesus Christ, to sacrifice for him to suffer for him, to put your own agenda aside for him. It's love. If you think about your earthly relationships, right? I don't want to reduce God down to any earthly relationship because it's not even close, but just think about husband and wife, right? I go to wife I love. What, what makes me want to sacrifice for her? What makes me want to hurt for her? What makes me want to serve her. So yelling and screaming kind of gets my back loosened up, so I'm feeling pretty good right now. But I've had, this is my eighth day of walking crooked. And it's, OK, it just sucks, right? <clears throat> so last night, I'm on the couch. And I'm, you know, crooked. and. I don't want to do anything because I'm in pain. But but I look over and and there's Jackson with the with the you know Uno the card game Uno you know what I'm yeah. and he says with his little Jackson y smile, <laughs> I want to have a family Uno game. <laughs> and Meredith, rightly so, she's like, well, guys, you know, Dad's kind of hurting and maybe maybe it's and I'm like, no, I'll do it. And so I get up and I hobble over to the table, you know, and, and I sit down and played a couple games of Uno, the four of us. Why did I do that? Because I love him. That's why. Can, can we just be honest? Like, if you don't love, I know we're supposed to be Christians and love everybody. I get it. But if you don't love, every, if you don't love a dude, if you don't love a girl, do you really want to go do something for them? Really? Not really. Don't leave me hanging up here like I'm the only sinner in the whole place, right? <laughs> All the holy people are over there, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, thanks. <clears throat> but when you love someone, it just makes it so much easier, right? Can I just help you love Jesus? He never did anything wrong. He was hanging out up in space somewhere, having a good old day, being God and stuff. And he decides to come down here, live in this thing, and live with the people that he created who hated him. And the ones that he loved murdered him. And he did it willingly 
because he loves you. That's all. For the joy set before him, which was you, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, because he loved you. Now obey. <laughs> now obey. Right? Now obey, because he loves you. How many, how many people, I know that, Jeff, how many other people in here served in the military? Raise your hand. He did. He did. A couple people served in the military, right? How many guys or gals are going to want to sign up to sacrifice and maybe even suffer a bit for a country that you didn't love? You want to go sign up for that? I hate it here. Let me put my life on the line for it. Nobody wants to do that. But it's a lot easier to sacrifice and obey and lay your life down if it's for someone that you love. Love encourages obedience. But not only that, there's this. 2 John chapter 1, verse 6 says this. And this is a line that most people don't want to cross, but God crosses it. He says that love means doing what God commands. Do you see that? Love means doing what God commands. And so, loved ones, don't limit what love is. So, love definitely is what you think. Love is definitely what you feel. But love also is what you do. Okay? And so, Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my commands. But this verse here takes it even maybe a little bit further than that. And it doesn't say that if you love me, you keep the commands. It actually says that keeping the, man, the commands is love. Love means doing what God commands. Okay? I'm actually done here which is rare for me, but I sense that we just, as a church family, needed to spend a little bit more time in worship and response to him and spending time with him, not me. And so I just want to end with saying this, that all of his disciples there, John and Peter and Stephen and Mary and James and Paul and all them, they knew who he was. And they worshipped him. And they worked for him. And Jesus, of course, with no identity issue, he knows exactly who he is. He is the fullness of the Godhead. That's who Jesus Christ is. Creator, sustainer, eternal, supreme, Lord, God, and King. That's who Jesus is. He knows who he is. They knew who he was. How about you? How about you? And how will you respond to his command to go make disciples of all people? Will it be once and for all? Everyone look here. Will it be once and for all your main thing? Or will it just remain a thing? That's the question. The lordship of Christ in your life is really what's at stake. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for truth. I thank you for setting us free from all these false gods and Christs that we have formed. Jesus Christ, you are from everlasting to everlasting. You are Lord, God, King. The angels worship you. You are the creator, the sustainer, the lover of our soul, our friend, our Messiah, our God. Lord, help us where we are weak, we have intellectual assent right here. We have heard your word proclaimed clearly and we understand and 
most of us, if not all, would agree with what has been said, but yet our response will not reflect that we believe it. Time and time again, we hear your word, we are convicted and do nothing about it. Nothing changes. You are clear in your word also that says to not just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of this word, lest we are deceiving ourselves. And heaven forbid, Lord, we ever come before you and say, Lord, Lord, and you say, who are you? Who you are and what you have done demands our need to bow and demands our greatest effort, our first and best always for you. You have come to seek and save that which is lost and you've put us on mission with you. We are partners with you to the glory of God to build your kingdom, to advance your kingdom to the ends of the earth. Help us to do that, Lord. In Jesus' name.